Good morning. If you take a copy of God's Word and open it to the book of Micah, uh, if you're wondering where that is, it's in the Old Testament, so find uh, the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then go left. Uh, there's a couple of small books at the end. Uh, you might could find Jonah, Micah, Nahum. If you get in that area, you're in a good spot. If you can't find it, uh, look at your neighbor's Bible. If they can't find it, um, it's okay. Worst case scenario, you probably won't ever win any Bible trivia stuff, but you'll, you're okay, all right? So just try to find it if you can. Um, you might get there at the end of the sermon, but it's a really small book found at the end of the Old Testament, uh, the book of Micah. Micah was a prophet. Um, over the next couple of weeks together, we're going to look uh, just kind of a, a bit of the backstory or more or less the intent of some of the carol writers and what they meant when they wrote their song. And so this morning, we're looking at a song uh, for a brief moment of, uh, from Charles Wesley called, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Uh, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus was written by Charles Wesley, who is one of the founders of the Methodist Church in 1744. It was published for the very first time in 1745, and it was added to his Advent hymnal called The Hymns of the Nativity of Our Lord. It was so popular that it was reprinted about 20 different times, that hymnal was, because Charles Wesley wrote this hymn, this Christmas carol, with the intent of kicking off the Advent season. Now, we're, we're actually kicking off the Advent season this morning as a church. Now, we're not, we're not lighting the candles or celebrating Advent. We do that about every other year as a church family, but you might be doing it at home. And, and what you might recall in the first candle that you light, it's the prophecy candle. It's talking about the coming of Christ. And so Charles Wesley, when he wrote, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, actually used the minor prophets primarily to get his material for writing this Advent him, this, this Christmas carol that we sing. In the first two verses of the first uh, verse, or the first two lines of the first verse, it says these words, come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. In the next verse, he says these words, born thy people to deliver, born a child, yet a king. It's interesting that Charles Wesley used these words, especially since he gathered them from the prophets. Let me just explain for a few moments. When we read in just a few moments, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it'll be very familiar to you. It's one of the most uh, well-read or most read verses during the Christmas season. Uh, it talks about Jesus coming and being born in Bethlehem. But Micah is a prophet not in good times. Micah was preaching to a people who were about to be overthrown, and he prophesied primarily about a, uh, a new day, a coming day, when the last king of Israel, King Zedekiah, who ruled and reigned from Jerusalem in the southern kingdom, would be overthrown and he would be killed. As a matter of fact, as we read the text before us, it's important that we obviously put the Bible in context so that we can understand the beauty of verse 2. I want to read it to you for just a moment, and then I want to explain what's going on. It says, Now muster your troops, O daughters of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Micah writes, in the midst of a turbulent time. The northern kingdom had already been captured and its ten tribes, Assyria, had come down and just decimated the area, taken everyone into captivity, and all that remained were the two clans or the two tribes of the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom is where Jerusalem was, and the Assyrians waited. 
They waited to take the kingdom from them to overtake Jerusalem. And of course, we know in 586, 586 under the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon eventually would ruin and sack Jerusalem once and for all. But they were waiting for this to happen. They had heard of the ten tribes being taken. The armies had been gathering around them. They were uneasy, to say the least. They knew their time was coming. It was a matter of days, perhaps even hours, maybe months before they would not have a home any longer. They would be in captivity. As a matter of fact, when we, when we read the story behind the story of what's going on in Micah chapter 5 before we get to the beautiful verse of verse 2, we read it in 2 Kings chapter 25 and we read that King Zedekiah, because he was a coward, he was the last king in Jerusalem in the southern kingdom, because he was a coward, he took his boys and they ran into the wilderness. Zedekiah, his officers, his sons, they all took off and they abandoned the people and they fled and they ran. By the time the Babylonians caught up with them, they wanted to make uh, a scene. They wanted to, to make an example of this king of Israel. So what did they do? They killed his sons and they hit Zedekiah across the face with a rod, just as it says in the prophecy in Micah chapter 5 verse 1. And then they gouged out his eyeballs, brought him back to Babylon, and eventually killed him just to humiliate him in front of everyone. It's quite a beautiful Christmas story, to be honest. But the story doesn't really end there because while that seems to be the end, it really begins just as tragic, but Micah tells us about a hope. It begins just as tragic because the very first king, while Zedekiah was the last and it ends humiliating for him, the very first king ends the same way. The very first king's head was cut off, his boys were all killed, and then his body was spread out and nailed to bet shame the hands of the Philistines. The first king and the last king of the people were humiliated. The pagan rulers had said and pronounced, we're in charge, we're God, not you. So how is it that Micah can show up in the midst of this hostility, in the midst of chaos, and pronounce a message of hope? I'm glad you asked that, that this morning. Because the reality is, it's very practical for us this morning. Many of you in this room, your life is really a glorified dumpster fire, just to be honest, right? You would say that, man, my life is just chaos right now. My kids are rebellious. My husband left me. My wife left me. Nothing's going right. Job's a mess. Can't make enough money to pay my bills. Some situation in your life is chaotic. And what you sometimes don't like to hear is someone coming alongside you and putting their arm around you and saying it's going to be okay because sometimes you just want to karate chop them in the throat and say, no, it's not. Right? You been there? But the reality is, in the midst of something that we can't even begin to comprehend, Micah comes and he embraces the brothers and sisters and says, it really is going to be all right. And it's not because I'm telling you that, it's because God has said that. I want us to look at this text for a few moments. And I want us to see the beauty of what is pronounced in the beauty of the Christmas story. One of the hard things as a pastor when we talk about uh, the Christmas story uh, this time of year, is it can get a bit redundant, right? Like, I, I've preached on everything, right? The three wise men, the donkeys at the manger, like the shepherds, everything, right? You kind of, like, you feel like you run out of material at some point, right? And so it can get a bit redundant. It can be, feel a bit redundant to you, like you know the story. And, and so sometimes we miss the actual beauty of what happens in that moment of the incarnation. 
And a lot of times our idea of the Christmas story comes down to like niceties, right? Like, well, we just, we really love the Christmas story because we love nice little baby Jesus in the manger and the fact that it was a silent night, right? Like we love the niceties of it. It looks clean. It looks nice. It's, you know, it's about a baby who doesn't like a, a baby, right? And it's, it's just nice. Everybody comes to, the, you know, comes to the manger. And we just forget that like Herod was having all these two-year-olds slaughtered and killed. And nobody liked the wise or the, the, the shepherds because they didn't take baths. And everybody was racist. So they didn't care anything about these Bedouin shepherds from Bethlehem. They forget about the fact that it was a census. And everybody was having to leave their hometown and go to a foreign place because they were under, press, under oppressive rule. They forget about the fact that there was under a Roman police state. It, it really was wasn't that, 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 that glamorous at all and that nice. But, but the, beauty of the, the beauty of the nativity story is understanding what we will see here in just a moment, that, that God comes to us, God comes to us, just be clear about that, God comes to us in the middle of a dumpster fire because he is great and we are not. Because he loves us when we were not lovable. When you understand that, it makes it far more majestic. Like if you came to my house today, you might say, oh, your, your house is nice or whatever. But you don't, you don't understand the beauty of the fact that me and my wife have a house. Our first house was in the top of a barn that nobody wanted to live in. I made $125 a week. And so me and my wife look at that 22 years later and we say, you don't understand the beauty of the fact that we have a house that's not on the top of the barn and I have a job, right? You can identify with that. Like people might say nice things about you, but they don't know what you've been through to get there, right? This is the gospel message. When we look at the nativity story, it is far more beautiful than any of us can begin to comprehend because of the dumpster fire of a world in which Christ came into. And that's exactly what's happening in Micah chapter 5. In Micah chapter 5, people are scared for their lives. They are about to lose their home. Their king is a coward and about to run and have his eyeballs gouged out. And Micah says, hope is on the way. I want to make four simple observations this morning, and I will be brief. I don't promise, but I will try. Number one is this. Jesus Christ is the long-expected king. That's what Charles Wesley writes about. We fast forward about 500 years from this story, and we pick up our Bibles in the New Testament after about 400 years of absolute silence, and we read these words. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? Now, again, context is key. There's not supposed to be a king. The last king, Zedekiah, is dead. There's not been a king. 400 years, there's not been a king. I'm King Herod. You're telling me there's somebody else? So naturally, when they said, for we saw the star and it rose and we've come to worship him, Herod said, nah, and he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And so he assembled all the smart people, the chief priests and the scribes, and he inquired them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him as they opened up the scroll of Micah in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people. Nearly two years after the birth of Christ, when the Magi finally show up, the chief priests and the scribes knew exactly where to look to tell King Herod, who was paranoid and power-hungry, where this king would be from. There wasn't supposed to be a king, but if a king did come, if a Messiah, a Christ would come, he would have to come from Bethlehem because that's what Micah said. Not only that, we, we know that in the life of Christ, when Jesus was declaring his messianic kingship, perhaps the first statement of this is found in John chapter 7, 
when Jesus is telling the people, he says, I'm the living water. Like, if you want to live forever, you come to me. I'm the living water. So the people went to the side, and they started talking to each other. And the Bible tells in verse 42, the common folk started saying, Has not the Scripture said that Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? In other words, let me just put it this way. Both common people and religious people who knew a lot about their Old Testament Bible knew that Messiah would be the coming king and he would come out of Bethlehem. After nearly 500 years of no prophet, all the people in the day of Christ understood that a king was coming and when he did come, he would come from Bethlehem. So here Jesus is pronouncing his kingship, pronouncing his messiahship. Everybody's confused because they want him to just take everything over, right? Because that's what an earthly king does, but then he goes to a cross. But yet we know, as Charles Wesley explains to us in that beautiful carol, that Jesus Christ is the true and better king. He's the one that the people were promised. He is the hope yet to come. But a second observation of the text is just as simple. Jesus is the great king born, but listen to this. He was born in a not-so-great place for one, for one simple reason, so that God alone would get the glory. Jesus Christ is the true and better king, and he's born in a not-so-great place so that God alone gets the glory. Listen to what it says in verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, if you're wanting the word Ephrathah, it's the first name of Bethlehem. It's given to us in Genesis 35, the first mention of Bethlehem, when Jacob buries his beloved wife, Rachel, there. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, in other words, you're so small, you're not even worth mentioning. You're not worthy. From you shall come for me one who shall be the ruler of Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient of days, from the eternal God. It's an interesting statement when you understand it in context. The people are on the verge of defeat. They don't even have enough people to muster troops and to fight back, to be honest. Their king's a coward. He'll run, have his eyes gouged out, eventually be killed. They have no hope whatsoever unless some sort of messianic superhero rises up. And where would this messianic superhero rise up from? Well, certainly he would rise up from the big city of Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem was a place where all the nobles lived, where all the military leaders with the authority lived. It was where everyone who was anyone lived, right? We still act like this today, right? 2,000 years later. All the important people lived there. But then Micah says, but it's not going to be from where the important people are. It's going to be from the little town down the road that you guys don't like very much because a bunch of Bedouin shepherds live there and you're all a bunch of racists and they smell really bad. You see, Bethlehem was the equivalent distance of essentially downtown Lakeland to Bartow. It's about half a day's walk or a couple of minutes in a car. They just didn't have cars back then. It's just right down the road. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, you know that it only takes just a few minutes to get to Bethlehem. It was a place where all the poverty-stricken people with no resources who shepherded, you know, sheep, that's where they lived. So Micah shows up and says, well, guess what? Your new leader is not going to rise from the ranks of human authority or noble class. He's going to come from that stinky little town down the road that nobody wants to talk about. Well, why is this? Well, it's because God alone will get the glory for what's about to happen. God seems to always do this, doesn't he? He seems to always choose the lowly so that we can't boast in our own merits but only boast in His mercy and grace. The Apostle Paul understood this in 1 Corinthians 1, 27-31. He says, But God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is 
low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring nothing, things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ, who became to us the wisdom of God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts what? Boast in who? The Lord. This is the story of Scripture, that God is going to satisfy His promises, that God will have a people for Himself, but He alone will get the glory. John Piper writes it this way, God shows us a stable so that no innkeeper could boast and say, He chose the comfort of my inn. God chose a manger so that no woodworker could boast and say, He chose the craftsmanship of my bed. He chose Bethlehem so that no one could boast and say, the greatness of our city brought forth the divine. God always chooses the lowly. He comes to you and me when we are unlovable. And he comes to us because he loves us and he is glorious and he is gracious and he is merciful. And when we receive him in believing faith, we can never boast in our own merit because it's only by the grace of God that he saves us. Jesus does not come because we are great. He comes because he is great. This is the point of him being born in Bethlehem. It signifies that God will fulfill his glorious purpose in the most unusual ways so that no one gets glory but him. Therefore, it should not surprise us that when the angels show up in Luke chapter 2, what do they pronounce? Glory to who? God in the highest. Not you, not me, not the shepherds, not Mary, not Joseph. God gets the glory. We get the joy, but God always gets the glory. It's not shocking though, is it? This story's been told time and time again. By the time we get to Luke chapter 2, it should sound a bit familiar to us because, again, the Bible is one big story with the hero, Jesus Christ. We look in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is the prediction of Christ. The Gospels reveal Christ. The Acts preach Christ. The Epistles explain Christ. And the Revelation expects Christ. And by the time we get to the New Testament in Luke chapter 2, we're already familiar with the story of Christ because it's been told to us time and time again. For instance, a story that would have come to mind when they thought of Bethlehem would have been about their great shepherd king, King David. The most famous event in his life that you and I might recall from being a little child, maybe the first Old Testament story you ever learned was about David killing Goliath. And the point of the story is not, if David killed Goliath, you can kill your giant too. That's stupid. If you ever go to fight a nine foot tall guy, let me know. I want to videotape and put it on YouTube. You understand? It's not going to work out. The point of the story is Jesus Christ. Notice what happens in the story. It's telling us about the coming Christ. David is the runt of the litter. He's not to be king. He's part of a bigger family, and he's not the firstborn. He's the runt. And no one from the military under King Saul, the first king, had the guts to deal with Goliath. I'm not doing it. You're not doing it. Nobody would deal with it, but David was getting a little ticked off because he kept defying the armies of God. He said, I'm going to deal with this brother. So he goes, and you know the story, right? You know what happens? King Saul says, you're not going like that. You're a dirty little shepherd from Bethlehem. If you're going to go out against their greatest soldier, you got to look soldier, you got to look a little bit like us. You gotta look like you got your act together. So put on my armor. It wasn't about security. Saul knew he was gonna die. It was about looking the part. And David said, No, I'm good. I've got five smooth stones and a slingshot. That'll do the trick. 
And David walks out on that field, not looking like the noble class, but looking like a dirty shepherd from Bethlehem. He kills the giant, then he cuts his head off, signifying the promise of Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. By the time we get to Luke chapter 2, it does not shock us at all that the King of kings and Lord of lords does not show up amongst the noble class. He shows up in the dirty little town of Bethlehem. Because he, after all, would do not what the world would do, but he will slay the greatest enemy of all, and he will stomp out his head. You see, the Bible tells us this story because it's important for us to know that when King Jesus comes, he comes from a not-so-great place so that only God gets the glory. But a third observation of the text is very simple. It's found in verse 4. We skip down to verse 4, and we learn that King Jesus is the one who delivers all of God's promises. In verse 4, it says these words, And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord is God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. This is poetic in nature in the fact that it paints the opposite picture of King Zedekiah. Zedekiah is a coward who is not standing for the people. He is not shepherding the people. He is demonstrating no strength. They have no security. They don't even have peace within the walls of Jerusalem, much less peace that pervades amongst the entire planet, the earth. These people are like, what are you talking about? I just want to not lose my home tomorrow, and you're talking about a greater king? It's exactly what I'm talking about, Micah says. When this Jesus comes, he will deliver on all of God's promises. The Apostle Paul tells in 2 Corinthians 1.20 that Jesus Christ himself is the yes and amen of all of God's promises. For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. That is why it is through Him that we utter amen to God for His glory. The Bible tells us that when Jesus Christ comes, that He will satisfy all of God's promises. You see, in the moment of chaos, in the middle of the dumpster fire of life, it looks like God has either forgotten them or He has reneged on his promises. He is not going to do what he said because if he is going to shepherd them, if he's going to stand with them, if he's going to give them strength, if they're going to dwell securely, if they're going to have peace on the earth, it sure doesn't look like it right now. But yet Micah reminds them that God has made a promise and the promise keeper, the Lord Jesus Christ, is coming. What's also interesting about what is said in this moment is it's a descriptor of the greatest king that they knew. The greatest king that they knew was David. He was a king. He was from Bethlehem. He was the ruler of Israel, ruled in righteousness, if you will, and he was a shepherd. The problem is David's dead. David's no more. So who? And David had all kinds of problems, but he was the best they knew of, and he's gone. But yet God had promised. And that's why when we see the world falling apart around us, we need to rest in the fact that Jesus Christ is the yes and amen of God's promises. He is the true and better king, the better son of David. He is the one who rose out of Bethlehem. He is the ruler of all people. He will shepherd in strength. And in might, the Christmas story reminds us that our hope has nothing to do with our achievements or where we live or the elected officials in office. Our hope has to do with the achievement of Jesus Christ on the cross, his glorious death and his glorious resurrection. As soon as you start hoping in the world, you will be sadly disappointed at some point. What these brothers and sisters needed to know is your king is a coward and he's going to run and you're going to lose your home, but hope is coming. 
Let me make a final observation and we'll be done. And this is the most important observation from the text. And that is that Jesus Christ, the King, came to give us peace. Look at verse 4 again. It says, He will stand, He will shepherd, He will shepherd in strength. His name will be glorious amongst the nations. He will help us dwell securely and He will give peace. The Bible tells us that He will stand with His people. He is alert. He is not slumbering. He is not asleep. God is always working on behalf of His children. When things seem to be chaotic and the world seems to be unraveling around you, you can trust in the living God of heaven because the promise of God is that He will stand with you. We inherit the promises of God when we come to believing faith in Jesus Christ, but one day we will claim the promises of God when we live with Him forever and ever in eternity. The Bible says He will shepherd His children. He will lead us to green pastures. He will take us to still waters. You know the psalm. David even wrote it, and he was their greatest king. But he wrote about a greater king. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God stands with his people. He shepherds his people. He serves his people with perfect strength and sovereignty. The Bible says his name will even be great to the ends of the earth. Think about that for a moment. The people just wanted a king who would be great in their own city for their own security. But the Bible says that the true and better king, when he comes, his greatness will pervade throughout the entire planet. His glorious name will be known throughout the entire earth. Our security and hope is not bound by boundaries or fences. His glory fills the earth, the Bible says. But lastly and most importantly, the Bible says that when he comes, he will bring peace. Jesus Christ comes and brings peace right now between us and God. Through his blood atonement on the cross, we can have peace with God by coming to him and believing faith. But the Bible also pronounces a greater peace that's coming, and it's made available through the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. And that's a peace when his new kingdom and his new earth are remade. On that day, we will be perfectly secure, no fear of sin or any of its threats. But we will live in the perfect peace of God, all made available because Jesus Christ came to us. Now think about it for just a moment in its context. King Zedekiah was the last king of Judah, destroyed in 586. It had been 500 years, there's no king, no hope. By the time we get to Luke chapter 2 in the nativity story, all the shepherds knew was everybody hated them. They smelled really bad. They weren't worthy to go into anybody's presence. And they lived in a Roman police state. They were completely oppressed and afflicted, but they recalled the promise that was made 500 years earlier. So all of a sudden, one night, as they were doing what shepherds do, the Bible says the heavens opened up and the angel pronounced, Glory to God in the highest. And listen to what they say. On earth, peace among those with whom he's pleased. You know what they did when they heard that? They said, heck yeah. And they ran straight down to the major scene and they began to worship King Jesus. You know what they did after they worshiped King Jesus? They couldn't get enough of it. So they were running around town telling everybody that hated him that peace had finally come. When you meet the king of peace, you won't be able to keep your mouth shut about it. In the middle of your dumpster fire life that seems like it's unraveling and there's no hope, when you meet the king of peace, you won't be able to keep your mouth shut about it. Now, the shepherds had to go back and be shepherds. Their earthly life didn't get any better. But inside, everything changed because the king of peace had arrived. Brothers and sisters, what we worship at Christmas is this. We worship the king of peace 
because he has come to give us peace now, and one day we will enjoy his peace forever. That's why Charles Wesley wrote the hymn, Come Thou Long Expected King Jesus. Why? Because he longed for the day when King Jesus would split the eastern sky and bring peace forever and ever and ever. For 2,000 years, the church has been waiting for the expected Christ, King Jesus, the King of peace, to come back and rule on his throne. When you come to Jesus Christ today, he'll give you peace right now. It won't make your life probably better tomorrow. You still have that sorry boss you got to deal with. Your kids will probably still be a mess. But everything in here will change. Because your hope isn't in all that. It's in the King of Peace who came because he loves you so much. And the Bible says that no one is too far gone for the grace of God. As a matter of fact, the bigger of a mess you find yourself in, the more glory God's going to get out of it. He loves to make trophies of grace anywhere he can find them. All you have to do is call on the name of the Lord, and he'll save you. Let's worship the King of Peace today, because he's come to us, and he's coming again. God, we love you, and we thank you that in the midst of the mess of our lives, You came to us to offer us salvation. We thank you that you love the world so much that you sent your one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, I pray that we'd respond like the shepherds, that we'd worship you at your feet and we wouldn't be silent, but we tell everybody we know that we found the king of peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing the song together?